I am going to um, open the next uh, session that we have, which is session four, Positive Approaches to Waste. Uh, that's being uh, chaired by uh, Professor Andy Henley from Cardiff University for us. So um, you're very welcome, Andy, and I'm going to uh, pass over to you now. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Um, so we, we, we're kind of moving very much from the the big picture that we've just been hearing about and um, the nature of the the emergency down to to really kind of I think what one might call kind of grassroots community level uh, and three presentations now which I'm really looking forward to um, on um, on the on the the subject the important subject actually of waste um, and um, what we can do with it what we can do about it uh, and how these solutions can be addressed right down at the sort of micro community level so um we've got three speakers and i think they're all now here so the first one is uh, uh, catherine stewart who's from aberystwyth so over to you catherine so hello i'm catherine i'm from the department of geography and earth sciences in aberystwyth and next slide please Um, originally, I was in environmental management and conservation. I turned to human geography when I became enthusiastic about Rob Hopkins' um, transition culture. Communities were coming together, as I'm sure many of you know, to tackle climate change and profligate resource use through, amongst, uh, amongst other things, resilience building activities. These are things like growing your own food, making bread, making your own clothes. Chatterton 2016 calls community activity of this nature post-capitalist transitions. And the idea of building resilience in this way has its roots in ecology with the concept of social ecological resilience. When a system is resilient, it can retain essential function. In the face of shock and adver adversity, the system, be it social, a community, um, ecological or even economic, is robust and it won't collapse under the stress. For my PhD, I wanted to know what motivated people to build resilience. So this is really following from what Aaron was saying. And I was curious about how they actually did it. Next slide, please. My approach to fieldwork was informed by feminist readings, and as such, I used immersive ethnographic fieldwork methods. So I became a volunteer in a community in West Wales who were building resilience through creating these post capitalist um, uh, projects, such as a forest garden, and they were also running an ecological shop. I conducted semi-structured interviews and I kept field, di field diaries of my own experiences being part of the community. Some of these interviews were candid and deep due to the fact that as a volunteer, I was backstage, Goffman, 1959, and I was more trusted by other participants. As a human geographer, I put my body to work and I used this to gain situated knowledge. Um, McMurrin, 2012, and Karen Gibson, 2017, if you're interested later. Uh, through this situated knowledge, I discovered a lot through visceral experiential learning, just through the simple act of physically being present and volunteering as a member of the team. And next slide, please. So the ecological shop that I was volunteering at sold um, a huge variety of goods, some new green goods, such as specialist books and tools, and also many special uh, secondhand goods donated by the local community. Of these were a huge amount of clothes. And as I became part of the textiles team, it's this aspect of my work on which I'll focus today. So because I was in the team, I learned things that I probably wouldn't have learned had I just been solely relying on interviews, such as the fact that of these donated clothes, only around 50% of them were resellable. Uh, this was because um, 
the 50 percent of the clothes that were good we steamed them we priced them and we put them out for sale and any clothes that were dirty a bit broken maybe they had a mis missing button missing zip they were unsellable so they went into what was called the rag bag and then every few months the rag bags were collected by the rag man he came from the midlands and he collected everything and then what i was told that out of all these rags um the rag rag man would sort these clothes into africa quality and this these were sold on at a cheap price to women in africa who could then make a business out of them but all of the rest of the things that was not africa quality ended up being incinerated in germany and i was really struggling to understand how a shop that was started to further sustainability in a developed country was sending so many clothes to be burnt in Germany. And I was sort of staggered under the weight, just imagining this going up on, up and down the whole of Britain, all the, all the charity shops in all the British high, high streets. Um, next slide, please. And so, um, a volunteer, Helen, she had already had a plan and I got together. Um, I was her sort of willing accomplice. Helen took, um, a lot of t-shirts home she washed them um, and meanwhile I was um, making posters and we both invited members of the community to our free upcycling workshops so what we did next was we learnt how to cut the t-shirts in a, a special way um, into one continuous ball of yarn and that's what you can see in the picture uh, we invited members of the public and then we learned how learned together how to um, crochet them into these colorful rag rug rag rugs and this activity falls under what hopkins describes as resilience building because we weren't simply recycling them further afield we were dealing with the waste in situ um, so we were making a, a tighter feedback loop. We were also increasing the amount of skill in the community as people learned to crochet, thereby they were becoming more self-reliant. So unfortunately, the rugs are at the moment not economically valuable, really, because not when you compare them to mass produced goods. It, they, it's just they take way too long to make. But they are of very high cultural value, as I will come on to. And of waste itself, uh, back in 1888, William Morris raged against the hidden waste of capitalism. And he had observed that um, there was this planned obsolescence happening with capitalism. And so he was at pains to avoid that when he developed his Kelmscott Press, Miller 2011. It is this very hidden waste that I confronted and was shocked by in my field work. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So we've we've got commoning together and uh, Chatterton in 2016 and Twigger Holroyd 2017 used the commons and commoning as a metaphor in order to, des to describe the type of activity where communities share resources, skills and knowledge. Twigger Holroyd says, quote, while the concept of commons is traditionally linked to the land, the principle is frequently extended to other physical resources and intangible cultural resources, sometimes called the commons of the mind, such as open soft source software, end quote. For Twigger Holroyd, the commons are like the natural commons of old in that they provide resources and sustenance to the people. Some areas will be visited more frequently than others and others less so according to the time of year. You can see people commoning here. They are sharing resources, knowledge, skill and friendship. And this is the high cultural value. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so we tried to build resilience by taking this hidden waste of capitalism and making something useful for it, whilst increasing skill in the community. Through my work as an activist scholar, I found that through commoning, through commoning together, people often had fun and fulfillment. Um, here, Whiskey Sanchez, a key knitter, um, it was her own pseudonym, by the way. She talks about the satisfaction gained from making something. She says, quote, 
It must be the same for people who garden or people who are really into DIY. That sense of satisfaction that you get after, yeah, you could pay somebody to do it for you, but it's yours, it's unique. And every time you look at it, you get a little like smiley face, laughs, end quote. So through this work, I saw how we use the ecological shop as a commons. Some areas were more frequented, others less. Um, people foraged in the shop for knowledge, resources and social capital. And through the act of volunteering, they common together as they sorted clothes and ran the shop. I spoke to participants who came to the community, and I think this is important for Aaron's point, with no prior knowledge of sustainability, but they found that the activities were so satisfying and the company was so good that it started to get them thinking about sustainability. So they, were, they became interested in the environment more as a byproduct. Um, and I think that this is a really crucial takeaway as such for NGOs, policymakers and the like who might want to increase engagement with sustainability. So therefore, to increase sustainability, we might like to do something fun, visceral and embodied together first and then let the theory follow afterwards. Uh, final uh, penultimate slide, please. Thank you for your time. There's my email there should you wish to get in touch with me or if you would like my bibliography, which is on the final slide. Thank you so much, everybody, and especially Barbara. Thank you very much indeed, Catherine. Lots of fascinating stuff and some great illustrations in there as well. So thank you very much. We're going to move straight on now to our second speaker. Um, and that's uh, Alvin Albike White, who I think is from Swansea University. Uh, um, there he is, waving at me. Uh, so the floor is yours, Alvin. Um, I'm hopefully, if you've got slides to share, hopefully we'll be able to manage to do that. Yeah, just bear with me. I swear I've done this before. Here we go. Where is my desktop? Okay. Hopefully everyone now can see my that's PowerPoint great. Yeah, slides. That's fantastic. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much to the organizers. I really appreciate this. I think it's been wonderful to hear such a variety of speakers. Um, I've only been able to join for a certain part of the day because of my other teaching commitments. But just looking through the program and seeing the variety, I think it's a wonderful uh, that you put everyone together. And I'm really looking forward to hear more. Uh, so I'm Al Dr. Alvin Orbach White. I'm at Swansea University. I'm in the Energy Safety Research Institute. And I'm also a founder of a company called Trim Tabs. And what I'm going to bring to you today is some ideas that I've developed through research and also some experience I've learned um, through trying to be entrepreneurial with that research. So the title is Clawing Our Way Back from Plastic Fantastic, because really, at the end of the day, plastic is actually, for, uh, uh, if we, for want of a better word, it's one of the best materials we've made in a long time. I should really say this at the beginning that this has come thanks to a lot of funding from a lot of different funding resources and also uh, various people who've come in and out of my research group over the years. Uh, can't do it without them. Yeah. And I'm going to make a quick advertisement that I've got two positions available in my research group that is funded by KES2. Um, one is dealing with uh, carbon nanomaterials and increasing efficiency of fridges. And the other is taking waste um, PPE and turning, in, in turning them into carbon nanotubes, which is something I think is quite uh, timely right now, given the fact that we've gone through COVID and we've learned so much about having uh, PPE and seeing so much gone out into the environment. So the, the context here, everyone is pretty familiar with. A lot of people have found different statistics and the statistics that I come from, uh, come back off is from this paper in Science, and Science Advances. It's called the, 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 fate, the History and Fate of All Plastics Ever Made. The, the bottom line here is uh, three points I'd like to make. The first is the amount of uh, plastic waste equates to about two tons per every three people on the planet. And even though the planetary uh, population is increasing, so is the amount of plastic. Uh, about 60% of plastic that we've ever made is discarded in one form or another. And despite the fact that we do have recycling, eventually uh, we only have one loop in this recycling and then eventually things go out to waste. So there's just, so this, in, in effect, this, I call it a, a recycling linearity. So what I try to do is I try to break that linearity and create uh, uh, products from waste plastic and try to create this um, more open loop uh, recycling system. So how do we do this? So I've got a very short video here. And what you're gonna see on the left-hand side is a person, they take a polystyrene plastic and they place it into a solvent called toluene. 
And very quickly over time, once they place it in, you can see that the polystyrene dissolves into the toluene, into the solvent. And we've just uh, submitted a paper which is under review. You can get the preprint here where we've gone into the mechanics of how this is done. We've belabored the point quite sufficiently, but you get the general gist when you see it here that once you get the right solvent and, and that mixes with the plastic, it dissolves quite readily. So as that continues to play, then I'll tell you what happens next. We will take this slurry mixture that is combined plastic and, and um, solvent, and we will take it and put it into our reaction chamber. So what you're seeing on the right or in the, in the center here is what the reaction chamber looks like uh, in the lab bench. It's got two zones where one zone turns it from a liquid or from a slurry into a vapor. And in the second zone, we turn it from a vapor into a solid. And there you can see very large quantities of plastic can be digested and easily dissolved in very small quantities of liquid. So you can condensify, or you can, sorry, you can condense plastics um, and then make that slurry into carbon nanotubes. And the carbon nanotubes are what we see on the right-hand side here when I'm highlighting or circling with my cursor. They come out as a black, it comes out as a black powder and it is inherently conductive. And that's why you're able to see even low voltage power can run through this and you can get very high current density through it and you, you can see the light bulb turn on and this was published in 2019 this first publication so we can take it from the macro scale that we see this uh, conduction but we can also go and look at the nano scale and we have ability to see uh, uh, the conduction of the carbon nanotubes using uh, scanning tunneling microscopy and here you're seeing a, a gif of several still photos uh, where Chris Barnett, the postdoc who did this, is analyzing the conduction. So we're analyzing the conduction both on a bulk scale and also on a nano macro, uh, macro scale uh, aspect. So we know it conducts electricity. And so when it conducts electricity, in effect, it can conduct data and signals. So we were able to create ethernet cables, the kinds that are potentially being used right now to conduct the electricity or conduct the signals to your home. Okay, and so what I did is uh, during lockdown, um, I, uh, I took some sample home and I made uh, samples, I made these uh, wires um, and then uh, connected them all up to a um, uh, RJ45 connector, which is the kind of connector that you'd be familiar with if you've ever plugged in an ethernet cable in your home or in your office. And we, uh, I basically ran the internet through this device. This is connected to my laptop and I was able to stream video and so on. So then uh, we did some more analysis, uh, more analysis on this using a technique called iPerf. And we have a preprint, which is also available now that you can have a look at where we made, uh, took polystyrene as, as the plastic source to make these ethernet cables. Now, if you compare it against the standard, which is what's used industrially, you get an uplink, uplink and downlink, downlink speed of about a thousand uh, megabits per second. Our cable is averaging 94, uh, 97. So we say it's about a hundred, um, uh, megabits per second, which is slightly better, but similar to a copper cable when we replace these black parts with just all copper. So uh, the carbon nanotube cables that we're making are at least as good as the copper cable. Uh, and the rest of this orange part, I should note, is copper cabling. And uh, it's better than broadband speed. Okay, broadband as determined by Ofgen has to be of this quality. And you can see that we're superseding that quality by several orders of magnitude. And one of the benefits of this then is that we can actually show demonstrations and I won't show it now in the interest of time, but if you ever are interested, go over to the Esri website and the YouTube channel and you can have a listen to a demonstration where I'm playing Bach cello suite uh, out of my laptop connected through a 3.5 millimeter jack and then into a speaker system. And we're actually now in the process of submitting a paper where we've done um, the analysis, the signal to noise quality data, et cetera, of the, uh, the cables um, from an audio perspective. Okay, so you might ask, why would we do carbon nanotubes? What's the point in doing carbon nanotubes? So in, in general, the real reason to work on carbon nanotubes uh, from the perspective at least of uh, electricity conduction is because it competes quite well with copper. So copper is a relatively dense material, 8.96 grams per centimeter cubed, whereas carbon nanotubes, single wall nanotubes, are at least uh, uh, almost a full order of magnitude uh, less dense. So the, in, in effect, this makes the material much lighter. Another thing that's also interesting is the thermal conductivity of nanotubes is much higher than copper. So sometimes you'll see when you look at uh, on a very warm day, not exactly today, 
but uh, and not exactly in the UK this time of year, but in some countries you'll see it very very often. You'll see that the the, the lines are sagging, okay, and they're sagging because the thermal conductivity is relatively low. So there's heat being retained in the lines, and that causes the material to expand. So you got some amount of thermal expansion, and as and as that expands. The, the line becomes longer and then the path length becomes longer and then the resistance goes up. And this is what happens with copper wiring. Whereas with carbon nanotubes, the th thermal conductivity is orders of magnitude much higher. So the, the heat can be dissipated much better and there's much less thermal expansion. So you're not gonna see the same physical effect. And, and again, the real reason is down to the fact that the conductivity is comparable between copper and single wall carbon nanotubes. So when we take this all into account, when we think about where will this best be utilized, one example we considered was, for example, if we're going to put them into aeroplanes. So uh, Boeing 747 contains over 140 miles of, of, of cabling. So we imagined if we has 141 miles of cabling predominantly made out of copper, how much does that weigh? And if we compare that against carbon nanotubes, how much does that weigh? So the copper, cab copper cabling is at least one and a half tons of, of, of dead mass sitting inside the, uh, the plane. If we were to use carbon nanotube cabling, the airplane would be quite substantially lighter because the total amount of carbon nanotubes would just be 350, si 350 uh, kilos. So that's uh, at least a, a factor of five dec decrease in the amount of weight. So you're lowering down the dead mass of the plane. So that has a, a knock-on impact in terms of the fuel efficiency. Because if you lower down the, the, the mass of the plane, then you need less fuel to burn in order to drive it the same distances. So when we do a quick calculation of this over the lifespan of a 747, which is uh, roughly 100,000 times uh, 100,000 uh, flying hours, we find that we could have a, a savings of about tw uh, 21 kilotons of uh, CO2 footprint. So there's some benefit to the use of lighter cabling. And we also should add, should add that we went into great pains to understand um, what's the effect of making the carbon nanotubes in terms of the footprint. And, and this value that we have here takes into account the fact of making carbon nanotubes on a lab-based scenario. So even though we were making the carbon nanotubes in a lab-based scenario and we were to make 356 kilos of it, we would still have a, uh, a savings, uh, relatively substantial savings in terms of CO2 footprint for air travel. So as I look, look forward to the future, and as I try to go from the lab bench into the marketplace, I, um, I, I look at it from this perspective, at least from the perspective of plastics. We've got a, a shifting supply chain, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, at an open opportunity to look at uh, face masks and PPE, but there's a lot of other types of plastics uh, that need work with. And something that I'm also very interested in is textiles and fabrics. Um, I believe there is ways that the, those can be chemically recycled as well. And what we can do is using chemical recycling is we can tailor the types of materials that we require between graphene nanotubes and carbon fiber. Now, where I stand now and where, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do, as well as perfect the science of, going, of doing the chemical recycling to understand the different plastics and how they affect the, the process and so on, I'm also trying to scale this operation up because ultimately, if this is really gonna make a blind bit of difference, it has to be able to be accessed by the general public. It has to be out in the marketplace. And that requires scaling up the process. And that's the first thing that often happens when I speak to investors is how do you scale up this process? And so when I was asked the question uh, from the Learned Society about uh, presenting here, they asked me, what are some policy uh, perspectives or questions that you have? And one thing I thought of is uh, to do with investments. It, it, it's very challenging as a startup company to get going and, and it could be beneficial to have uh, more, um, uh, more leniency maybe in terms of tax benefits or something like this for a startup company like mine to be able to uh, leverage funding. And not only that, uh, these processes are capital intensive, okay? So I, I am familiar with uh, Innovate UK. I've also been speaking to Smart Chemry. Um, I'm very grateful for the help that I've received from them. I've also had help from the Knowledge Transfer Network and so on. But I still find myself in a gray zone. It's still a very challenging place to get out of. And if we really want to have these, again, applications of science accessed by the general public, they have to go through this process, all right? Because there is potential in terms of air flight, We've shown that there's potential in terms of ethernet broadband capability and there's potential in terms of at the very least having listening to good sound quality music now one of the other things that came to me um, through the experience of having the company something that i wouldn't have learned had i just remained i think as an academic in this in this uh, endeavor 
is that insurance policy is actually very challenging. Um, recycling is something that we've heard a lot about. And there are many governments who are pushing towards uh, positive in, in, in recycling endeavors. But I've come to learn that uh, the insurance companies are quite hesitant to actually um, underwrite some of these processes. So even though we want to have more recycling, there is certain bottlenecks in, this, in, the, uh, in the evolution of, of a solution towards the recycling that are becoming more clear to me uh, as I as I as I navigate the research space as well as the entrepreneurial space. And if anyone is ever interested in, in, in discussing this, I, I would love to, I would gladly share what I've learned and uh, have more discussions about this down the line. So in conclusion, the, 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 the idea here is, is to consider waste as a resource. And the first example that I'm presenting you today is to make them into carbon nanotubes. And the reason why I do that is because carbon nanotubes have an inherent value. Uh, heat transfer and ma uh, heat transfer, electricity transfer are the two that I'm, I'm very interested in. But also they have a, a financial value as well. They're extremely expensive. Um, and it's one of the reasons it's held them back from a research and industrial perspective. But if we can use plastics as a carbon source, we can actually lower down the cost of the carbon nanotubes quite considerably. And that is what I am intending to do, both through the science and through the entrepreneurship. And uh, I look forward to any questions and discussion points later in the line. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Alvin. Um, and it's great to hear about, a, from my perspective, about a, potentially an entrepreneurial opportunity. I'm always interested to hear about uh, people who are trying to turn um, science, if you like, into, into genuine business opportunity. So um, best wishes with that. Um, we're going to move straight on now. And our third speaker is uh, Mayrosh Tak. Um, I think if I'm right, you're with the Royal Veterinary College. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, that's true. So, Hi. Very warm welcome to today's session. Um, and over to you. Okay, I can begin then. Um, hi everyone, I'm Mayor Roosh. Um, I work at the Royal Veterinary College. What I'm presenting today is uh, a joint project with the various people, um, as I've suggested, I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse, but um, the list of people, including Siobhan Madison, who will be speaking in the next session at the conference. So this um, project is about food waste and loss and so I'll go, I'll go from you know this I talk about systems and like how we could potentially measure and change um, food loss and waste uh, mechanism sorry someone's trying to call me um, right so what we did in this project is um, we um, it was a group exercise that we were trying to look at how true cost accounting if you, could be used to improve uh, food loss and waste. And we've come up with some policy recommendations. Um, and um, this, is, this work is funded by UKRI, by the Global Food Security Program. So just to give you a background on food loss and waste and greenhouse gas emissions, food loss um, is to do with uh, waste, uh, food wasted up to post harvest. Um, um, part of the supply chain and then food waste happens at retailer and consumer level so those are the two key definitions that we should be aware of but um, a third of the food um, globally is wasted and 40 percent of it comes uh, goes into landfills food waste is about 10 million tons a year and which can cost us about 17 billion pounds uh, annually which is approximately 20 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions and what is important, important to note over here is that um, the waste and loss occurs across the food system. So this is um, across like from production all the way to, to consumption and that it does not just occur at consumption level, which is where we come into, into place as consumers. So why are we looking at true cost accounting? Like the idea behind this project was to see if there were better ways of calculating and estimating uh, the uh, food waste and loss, and we thought maybe true cost accounting could be a way of, of defining this. Um, what is true cost um, accounting? It is a tool that helps us um, uh, understand better this and assess better 
the true costs and benefits of different food production systems and the implications for everyone. So the idea is that food is cheap in itself is quite problematic and there are multiple incentives and economic incentives and subsidies that are existing in our agricultural production system and retail systems that create a certain price for the chicken or the veg or the eggs that we consume. However, there are other costs related to production of these and distribution of these goods that um, are not accounted for. So this tool, this accounting tool essentially helps us and identify all of the costs that um, our economy and we as um, pe people in, on this earth pay for the food that we consume. What's important over here is to recognize that about for every one pound uh, of food uh, that we uh, that we pay as consumers, that there's an additional one pound indirectly of hidden costs that we are not paying for. So these could be in relation to soil degradation or law or um, or waste uh, that occurs at different parts of like the the value chain. Um, Food waste is commonly addressed at individual levels. So a lot of the policies and, uh, and solutions suggested for food loss and waste is, are suggested at, at consumer levels. So it's to do with recycling or disposal of the food that we do not consume at restaurants and, or at home. Um, however, what is what we're trying to uh, recommend in this report is that um, there should be greater focus on preventative measures for re reducing uh, food loss at different points of the of the system, um, and not just look at consumer level uh, ch changes or solutions that we could potentially create. So, focus be more than consumer behavior and think about how producer behavior and distribution behaviors in our food systems can change. So in this project, what we did is we conducted focus group interviews with various um, stakeholders, all the way from um, policymakers to wholesalers to growers and civil society campaigners and academics. And we did this this summer in July and August over five um, focus groups. Um, and here I'm presenting the four key themes of, um, of our focus groups and some recommendations. So the first um, uh, finding from the focus group was that personal and professional, uh, there are personal and professional barriers for reducing food loss and waste. So there's a conflict between the professional knowledge that people have who are working in the food system, uh, in different parts of the food system, but their, um, their ability to, to act on it in a personal capacity is limited. There are quite a few cultural and generational factors also that affect food loss and waste behaviors. But the key thing is there are systemic barriers that do not allow us to um, reduce our, uh, the loss and waste in, in the value chain. So the first being contracts between suppliers and supermarkets are structured in a way that there is automatic default food loss in between uh, the farm and by the time it gets the food gets to the retailers and supermarkets to us. Um, consumer expectations and hospitality and retail are in a up, have created these kind of food standards um, around say for example the shape of the vegetables um, or the size of the fruit that do not, that create another set of uh, post harvest harvest loss. Then is a uh, infrastructure for agriculture, which is, for example, in cold storage or other sorts of um, storage facilities are also quite poor and lacking, particularly for certain value chains. Um, and this creates further logistical challenge for redistributing the surplus or the, or the so-called waste that we create in our system. When lack of knowledge among general pop population about food waste and food system actors is, um, is another thing that we identified. Um, and uh, finally, the powerful status quo throughout this food system exists, which creates these, um, you know, conditions for, for waste. So here you have an example of a, um, a quote from, from a focus group where a wholesaler says, people want consistent supply, even of waste, um, which I think kind of speaks to uh, the point that our first um, speaker today was talking about that, you know, when you create these um, uh, 
value chains with certain things are not developed, even for waste are not developed. So they go to landfill. And so anything that cannot go to say Africa then goes to landfill, which is exactly what happens when it comes to food. So if the food is not consistent, the value chains for the waste part of our food also are, are, do not develop then. So the transport costs uh, are higher and this is where the wholesaler says transport costs are also an important factor in order to collect everyone's waste and to do something with it. We need to know what is coming and what can be done with that waste. The second theme that we identified in our focus groups was and that, that there is, even though there are many challenges, there are many opportunities for collaboration across the value chain. And um, the, the, the positive news from our focus groups was that everyone believed that this was the, this was the way to, to actually make change happen, to work together with growers, with retailers, and with distributors to, um, to reduce uh, waste and loss. Um, the other point they, that we, uh, that our um, interviewees mentioned was that grassroots organizations who are doing a brilliant job at producing uh, loss and waste at local levels um, are not aware of each other's work. So some sort of knowledge economy, building that knowledge economy where people can exchange ideas together and learn from each other would be important. Um, one, one of the bigger learnings from this process was that um, to decrease uh, food waste, we need to manage our demands and the current food, food system is geared towards meeting demand, um, which is what we call just in time systems. Instead of eating what is there to eat, uh, consume, we, the system is very much geared to fulfill the so-called demand of the um, population. And the demand is to do with um, cultural and taste preferences or, or preferences for what would be, you know, the fad food for, for the year rather than food security. Um, so create these uh, closed loop systems throughout the value chain and improve communal storage can be a good, uh, can be a way to reduce um, uh, food waste and loss through collaboration. And planning uh, for cropping and transport is highly complex, so it's difficult to manage at local level. So there are these. Uh, local level solutions, but also large, large scale um, macro level solutions that one needs to uh, think about. And um, uh, we will talk about that a bit more in, um, towards the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, the next theme that we identified was that um, TCA has benefits and opportunities for collaboration, but it's only one tool in the whole, in the uh, in, a, in the toolbox to reduce uh, food waste and loss. So there are aspects of true cost accounting that are already practiced in other uh, formats and institutions, and there's ample data already existing, um, but it needs uh, to be analyzed more uh, deeply. So TCA has a holistic process. Uh, TCA's holistic perspective could help government and policymakers to potentially think about sanctions around uh, loss and waste and subsidize reduction uh, measures. So instead of having incentives that promote uh, loss and after um, post harvest or at retail level, um, there are incentives created based on the data that exists to, um, to sanction where loss does occur in the, in the value chain. This should, um, this, the, the, this will also help the government to create fairer producer and retailer relationships. At the moment, at a retailer level, there's high concentration of corporate power, which uh, imbalances the relationship between producers, the farmers, and um, and the retailers. So the TCA uh, can uh, can help understand, uh, can help create reduce this imbalance. Um, and it can also rebalance the cost of disposal uh, methods and develop a holistic approach to value food waste as per the Das Gupta report that was published um, earlier this year, last year. Uh, and uh, the final um, and the final fourth um, theme that we identified from those focus groups was um, challenges and short, there are challenges and shortcomings of the DC and as I previously also men mentioned that um, the, the first thing was uh, the main challenge of TCA is that it is actually, it does not actually account for actual costs and um, the, the cost in itself is not true. It, um, 
uh, and the changes to price if we were to rely on the true cost of accounting and add them to actually pricing of uh, food, the changes to prices would be considerable and pose potential risks through health, healthy diets, for especially for low-income consumers. Um, so a quote over here, yes, you can read um, at the bottom of the slide is um, thinking about, external, about externalities is um, supposed to make organizations understand what their externalities are, what their risks are, what their opportunities are, what their costs and benefits are. This is not supposed to in principle trickle down to the consumers. So, the, so our interviewee says that um, the TCA is essentially a policy making tool rather than a tool to actually say that, say the carrot that costs one pound should actually cost two pounds. It's more to understand that there are other hidden costs within the economy that various agencies may be incurring. So the policy recommendations um, uh, from our report are uh, to enforce uh, supplier retailer contracts that address food waste and loss me uh, measures. Um, so the idea to where if we can measure where the food loss is happening in the, between the supplier and the retailer, um, there to be specific metrics related to food waste and loss also. The second was uh, um, to make supermarkets disclose or the, uh, the FLW and uh, set mandatory targets to decrease a certain percentage annually. And this very nicely ties into the national food strategy that was published a few months ago. Third was to change rules and regulations around animal feed. So if we can use some of the food wasted and uh, the, the, the loss in the value chain for animal feed. And as you can see at the bottom right of the slide, this is Tristan Stewart's campaign, the pig idea where they are advocating for the food uh, waste from the value chain to be fed to uh, pigs. Um, the fourth um, policy recommendation is that um, business rate incentives for suppliers, retailers, and hospitality do address these uh, true cost accounting targets. So again, incentivize, create change incentives for suppliers and retailers and hospitality. So more on the distribute on the on the distribution side of things. The fifth recommendation was to address supply chain inefficiencies, that is to support public procurement uh, directly from suppliers. So there's, um, the, the, we can shorten the supply chain. And finally, um, there is more research and development needed to understand uh, what infrastructure can support food waste and loss and dis uh, for distribution hubs, and also to uh, develop a, data a database linking relevant schemes such as the carbon footprinting, the animal welfare and socioeconomic databases that can then generate and encourage true cost accounting principles and practice. So I think that's the end of my slide deck, but I would like to thank um, my team uh, that are not here today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Mehrush. Um, and that was really interesting, um, really thought provoking in the sense of, you know, you think of food and waste and loss as being sort of people basically buying stuff and then throwing it away. But actually, I thought you really explored very well the some of the wider implications. And, and it's, a, it's a much bigger topic than simply what we stick in our food waste bins at the end of each week. Um, OK, um, we can uh, open up. We've got about 10 minutes, I think, for questions, uh, up to 10 minutes, I think, for questions. So um, more than happy to take questions. Um, perhaps while people are thinking about that, I can ask one or two questions of my own. Um, I mean, each of those presentations are quite different. And so um, I, I particularly thinking about Alvin's focus on plastics, and, and the sort of broader question I'd quite like to ask there would be, you know, to what to what extent should we be actually, you know, taking account of the fact that people are, should be moving away from plastics anyway as a raw material? I mean, I, would you agree that really, ideally, you'd be wanting to see the end of the raw material that you then want to use to recycle into something useful? Yeah, so I don't need plastics to make the material that I want to make. Oh. Um, and as much as I'd love to see a world without plastic, I can't see it happening. I can say for at least in one instance, I can't see it happening in the healthcare sector. It's near impossible to imagine 
at the moment going to a dentist and imagining every tool that you get doesn't come out of a sanitized piece. Uh, and there are other there are other examples, but that's the one line that I can't see it changing. Um, yes, I believe upstream that eventually we should ha have other materials that we don't need uh, plastics. And it's not just single use plastics. It's actually it's it, that's one of the aspects of it. But it's multiple streams of plastics are challenged by cha multiple streams of plastics, multiple types of plastics challenge our conventional recycling systems. In some cases, you can't even have one isomer in 10 million in uh, a recycling stream. So polypropylene is isotactic. And uh, if you got one isomer difference in a, a, a mechanical recycling system, it breaks down. So, so never mind having polystyrene and polypropylene if you can't even have one other component. It's, it's, so it's, it's, it's the, the technologies that we have are, are, are slow to catch up and even if you go across Wales, you know, what we do in Swansea is probably different from what's happening in Aberystwyth and other parts of, of, of Wales in terms of what you can actually recycle or not. It's not I mean, necessarily- I was, you know, I was made aware recently of the, the extent to which actually bags of recycled material are rejected for that very reason, that there's often contamination or there's simply, you know, too much of a mix of different sorts of elements. I mean, there's a comment in here from Simon Middlebrew says, it isn't the problem simply single use plastics? Um, I mean, I suppose that is ultimately, um, you, you've got a technical use, problem there to solve, but ultimately that the issue is one of reducing our reliance on them. The issue is longevity in lifetime, all right? Single use plastic as a dashboard for my car that might last for 50 years is a different situation for single use plastic that's a straw that gets thrown away. And the challenge here is when you go into the, from the technical into the social, technical and political is the language matters. It's very, very important because that's what goes into law. And it's, it's, it's so it's, and you want to make it as, as concise and detailed as possible, but not overly contrite with detail. Um, so single use plastic, yes, it is a problem. It's not the problem. Okay, thanks so much. I've, I've got a question. Well, I'm more than happy to encourage people to, to put their hands up. I can't see any up at the moment, but um, I've got a question for Mayrouche, really. And and uh, this is a kind of slightly economics -y question, and I'll admit I am, a, <laughs> economics is my sort of subject. Um, <clears throat> I wondered what the difference between your concept of total true cost accounting is and, and what economists would call, um, you know, understanding externalities and the divergence between marginal and, so, sorry, private and social costs. So, you know, what do you do with that? I mean, economists have, you know, long established sort of solutions that not, may not work, of course, in the form of, you know, taxes or regulation and things like that, which force people to take account of, of, of social as well as private costs. So is there a difference there? Yeah, very good question. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so this is the key uh, difference would be um, the true cost accounting will look at the, the negative and positive externalities and the actual cost of them and really at a system level. So you have like the whole food system and you are trying to look at the costs that are generated because of a loss in post harvest or um, say the soil degradation that happens and so on and so on and the cost then of soil degradation. So it's actually give um, quantifying that in terms of monetary value now, of which is why it's not the true cost, which is what I was trying to say on my slides. Um, and then um, the, the issue of whether this works or doesn't work then comes to political will in the end, right? It's not, we, we, um, we, we are, TCA is allowing us to quantify and again, provide a monetary value to these externalities. But what do we do with that information is the bigger question. So um, what we found out that there is enough data to identify these costs, but the data perhaps is with retailers because you know they govern the value chain in a certain manner and they they own the power in a certain way that retail that consumers don't, even though we're many consumers and there are only few retailers in this country. Um, so yeah, so externalities, they, in, methodologically, they would, they're essentially just extending the, the idea or 
um, of extent positive negative externalities to providing monetary costs. So, so do we really need food suppliers, supermarkets and others to try and kind of educate their customers a bit more? I mean, we've, I've grown up in a world which has moved from, you know, one in which, you know, you looked forward to the that, you know, early summer when you could go out and pick your own strawberries. And that was the first time in the year you ate strawberries to a world in which supermarkets will stick them on our shelves at any time in the year. Um, I mean, is it how do how do, how do, is there a role for food retailers and producers to sort of re-educate us back to a kind of a simpler eating in season type of approach? Yeah, that, um, that's a very good question. I think in, instead of re-educating us, it's more about uh, changing the systems themselves. So um, there's a whole bunch of literature on systems of provisions and value chain, global commodity chain literature, right, Where, which talks about how the new age com commodity chains are built up is about adding value to a product. So it's instead of, um, you know, a whole mushrooms, there'll be cut mushrooms already. So the value added is in cut mushrooms or um, in your in the case of strawberries as you say instead of us just going to the local pea, uh, local farm and picking strawberries ourselves or even growing them ourselves now why do we need to do that and wait for all of these months of producing strawberries in our gardens to because if they can come from spain or from latin america throughout the year or they're grown in like glass houses etc so um in the um I guess what I'm trying to say is that the retailers are doing that because um, this is their way of adding that extracting value from the system, from the earth that we live on and are not recognizing that, okay, whilst profits can be generated from this mechanism, this way of um, producing and selling things, um, and there is demand for it, but there are the other costs of these of, of meeting these demands. So this food system is very much, let's meet the demand of the consumers, but the, the demand, does not just come itself it's in you know it's in the, the demand is created because of the, the supply is there if that makes sense there's a really interesting comment here from um aaron uh, our sort of the first speaker before this session um and i'm trying i'm going to, going to try and sort of summarize what i think it's saying uh, about the sort of decoupling issues here um are we just stoking up problems further down the line when we think in in more in system terms about well if we if we strip copper out of planes we make lighter planes which are cheaper to fly and then we create more demand for you know high carbon footprint travel or similarly in you know in the case of food waste feeding waste to pigs we make it cheaper to buy pork meat and create more waste that way so i mean i, I mean i think you know I, is that is that is that an important issue, Catherine? I've not had a chance to really come in. I was I'm going to perhaps come back and let you have a chance to answer a question. Yeah. I was really interested in the way in which you know you, you there were some issues here, behavioural issues about how you involve people and what the motives are for involving people, um, and and I wondered whether you know how you saw that in terms of the issue really is for me is around saying well. To get people to think about these issues, you have to almost attack them from the side by actually mm -hmm. appealing to other motives. Is that true? Um, from my project, yes and no. I had very, I, I mean, I just spoke about a very small part of my research this afternoon, which is lightning. But from everything that I've seen, um, I had at least two very clear sort of motivational strands. I had the people who were theory and knowledge led and they had, um, you know, they, they, they were sort of, um, I, I don't know whether you, I don't know whether you'd call them guardianista types, but very sort of articulate and um, knowledgeable about the environment, sustainability, really on board with climate change and, and everything. And so they had the theory first, and then that informed what they did practically. And then I also had this other completely different um, motivational strand. And it was um, much more, and this wasn't just for uh, what I've spoken about. It was also in my talk, it was also for uh, forest gardening and furthering sustainability altogether. I had another group of people who 
had basically previously zero interest in the environment. Um, it just wasn't on their radar, but they sort of accidentally um, met people who were, were furthering sustainability. They joined in and they it made sense to them. It just made sort of, it made emotional sense. They had fun and it made a physical sense. I mean, some of them said, well, why would you throw a carrot in the bin? Why don't you put it on the compost? So they, they were sort of very... Uh, I suppose some might call it grounded. So yeah, I think, it came I think down to maybe temperament. Yeah, re really interesting comment about the where, where people, you know, how they trust knowledge. I'm my world with working with small businesses, people will often trust the knowledge that they receive from their peers rather than necessarily from where it's coming from, from experts. And so once you make those short connections, then you can start to really make start to achieve change. So thank you very much. We've run out of time. Um, but thank you very much to all of our three speakers.